to have it. the Vedic language is a mantric language that is the language of the cosmic mind. That language cannot be turned even into classical Sanskrit that easily, much less the modern languages of the world. That's why it's hard for people to understand that. But at that level, all the deeper teachings of yoga, Ayurveda, Jyotish, everything is in Rig Veda itself. Uh, one of the uh, other movements we've had, other issues that's having developing in the, in the world today, scientifically, historically, is now there is a recognition that the human species is at least 200,000 years old on the planet. That is the current estimate today. And yet, historically, we're still working with a timeline of five to 10,000 years. So what were human beings doing the other 190,000 years? In the Hindu tradition, as Sanatana Dharma, we speak of different yugas. There were different world ages. There were different eras of culture, civilization, or inner knowledge. You know, today we put so much emphasis on science and technology. When we look back historically, we judge cultures by science and technology. But what is the difference between the yogi in a cave and the caveman? The difference is the yogi, in the, cave, the yogi is a vegetarian. <laughs> but in terms of the development of consciousness, the modern scientists would not know the difference because the yogic development is something on the inside. If we can control our own minds, we can find the entire universe dwells within us. Then do we need a television set? Do we need a better screen, with, with bigger screen with better resolution? Uh, do we need a faster technology or a better chip? <laughs> we need that inner access. So what we're having today is Hinduism has preserved that deeper spiritual, yogic, meditational, Vedic knowledge, whatever you want to call it, by name. And that knowledge needs to expand to the society as a whole. That knowledge and that culture alone has the breadth and the depth to sustain a planetary culture. Local religions of one community versus another community cannot do that. We need to broaden that basis. And that is where, as we say, there's a tremendous opportunity for Hinduism in the 21st century, not just simply Hinduism as the name, but the ideas, the principles, the values, the practices, the teachings, the knowledge, the wisdom. And that has the potential to help humanity overcome this great crisis that we are coming into today and that is bound to develop over the next few decades. Again, I'm not going to say we're coming to an end of the world scenario, but we have to remember that even the 20th century had major world wars in the most civilized part of the world that ended up with the genocide of nearly 100 million people. The 21st century is also going to be having its challenges, and there is a potential for yet greater challenges to arise. Our current commercial culture is unsustainable. Uh, I'll also have to say that we cannot simply make business into the enemy. That is also not a solution. In fact, there are, in particular on the India side, there are a lot of the corporate people will have or do have positive ideas to improve the situation. Yet at the same time, we need to move beyond commercial values. And I will have to say, that if for us religion is conversion, our religion is still commercial. It is still a religion of converting, conquering, controlling the world, harvesting, controlling outer resources. We need to give up, move out of the era of religion as separate identity, and it could move into the era of individual spiritual practice in which we accept a broad universal path teaching for all humanity which again, we can connect to Sanatana Dharma. So it's very important that this Hindu Renaissance continues to grow and develop. And now we need to bring out the greater Sanatana Dharma side and better education into the whole field of what Hinduism is so that people understand the relationship of Darshanas, Vedas, Vedangas, relevance of all these teachings. 
and so they can articulate it. You know, one of the problems that happens to Hindus in the West is they go to school and so a teacher teaches them something negative about Hinduism. And I tell, they say, well, why are the schools doing that? I say, it doesn't matter. You should have taught your children better what Hinduism was in the first place. So when they run into the opposition, they know how to deal with it. Opposition is always there. Every group has had to struggle to gain its recognition or its identity. The Hindus can have to stand up for what is valuable in their tradition. At the same time, uh, there can be tolerance, there can be openness. We can be free to disagree or have different ideas and perceptions of truth with all due respect, just as in science as we do in religion. And it's very important that the Hindu point of view is better represented and is not just simply used as a means of uh, harmonizing or making everything the same. And there needs to be a greater sharing of all the great Hindu teachings, philosophies, different forms of Vedanta, different approaches to the divine. Hinduism is the only tradition that allows the full range of devotional practices, whether it's the worship of the divine as father, mother, brother, sister, beloved, friend, master, lord, use of images, not use of images, use of nature forms, not use of nature forms, mantras, yantras, every form of sadhana is there. The other traditions are much more circumscribed in that regard. Same thing as to the philosophical richness of the traditions. And in summary, in spite of all that has happened, today Hinduism is still the third largest religion in the world. It is the largest of the non-biblical tradition. So it carries the responsibility of preserving all the native traditions, all the traditions that, all the Dharmic traditions, and all the spiritual, mystical traditions of humanity. Many of these are unknown. Many of these have been done at an individual uh, level. And also as a way of knowledge, Hinduism can preserve that link to science, to medicine, to spirituality, that whole broader universal connection. So that is why I had one friend, uh, J.C. Kapoor, he says Hinduism is not a religion, it is the cosmic connection. It allows you to make a cosmic connection to whatever it is that uh, you are doing. And there needs to be a greater renaissance and revival of Hindu thought, Hindu values, Hindu practices in India, and also an integration of many wonderful things being done. But there is not that sense of Hindu unity uh, behind them. And again, you can preserve your sampradaya and its values, but you can still affirm a greater Sanatana Dharma. And in the Sanatana Dharma, there always is room for another point of view as long as the emphasis is on the greater fact of dharma rather than the outer factors of difference of ideas and perceptions. So as the century develops, there will be a continual development of Hindu thought. I have no doubt about that. The main issue is how much humanity is going to have to suffer before changing to create a more sustainable a more friendly culture. And here in India too, there are many social problems, overpopulation, lack of education. Uh, there are also uh, issues. But I will present this also before you that whatever problems that are there in India, as well as any other country in the world, you can find a solution in the Sanatana Dharma. <laughs> the solutions don't necessarily require looking to the outside. Actually, they require looking more to the inside. And if there is this deeper development of the Hindu thought, not as a separative thing, but as of a greater approach of universality, dharma, spiritual science, then I think there is great hope for India and great hope for the coming century. But these deeper perceptions have to be brought into the elite of the culture, they also have to be brought out more educationally. But the important thing is do something wherever you are. Wherever you are, 
promote a school, promote a teaching, promote a guru, do something. And whatever you're doing for the sake of the Sanatana Dharma, always bring in that greater sense of what the Sanatana Dharma is and how all the different teachers and teachings are connected. And even though we as Hindus may not see someone else as an enemy, you still have to recognize that there are those who may not see you as a friend and who may be working to undermine what you do. Be realistic in how you relate to the members of other religions. Do so in all friendliness. Uh, but remember, religion creates a very powerful samskara. And not all these samskaras are going to, are in favor of Hinduism. If you allow certain samskaras to come in, uh, they will not favor Hinduism, they will not favor a Sanatana Dharma. They will direct people towards divisive communities and they will also work to undermine certain dharmic values, even beyond the intentionality or the niceness of the person involved. Become very critical and aware of the effects of ideas, beliefs, practices, and culture combine the deepest sense of unity but with the most powerful viveka or discrimination. And that has been the main thing that has been weakness that Hindus have created is leaving that viveka out and becoming too willing to harmonize and compromise. Dharma is not something to be compromised. You cannot compromise Dharma. Uh, you can be open to other people's points of view. So please bring these practices into your life, share them with others, and bring them into your community. Uh, and you do not need to be self-effacing. This is our tradition. It is a beautiful tradition. It is a wonderful tradition. It should, be care it should be honored and cared for by all. We are not here to denigrate another, but at the same time, we do not have to denigrate ourselves in order to be here. This tradition is, I say, uh, to my point of view, the greatest that is available today, or it certainly can be the basis of that. So it's very important to give the proper honor to your own valuable teachings, and if you honor them, others will also honor them. If you compromise them, then they will not be honored by others, including by your own children. So please remember that. I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions uh, here, but I thank you for uh, giving me your attention. Uh, I have my own points of view on things. I try to harmonize at the same time, bring in some point of clarity, but it's important that whatever a speaker comes, me or someone else, that we go to a deeper level of examination. It's not a question of accepting or rejecting what the person simply has to say. But we need to set in motion a deeper vichara, a deeper inquiry, a deeper examination, a deeper study, and create a better presentation and understanding of these profound teachings and a better ability to communicate them uh, with others. So I hope that process is going on within you and continues to go on in a way that is helpful to you, your family, and your community. Uh, namaste. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Uh, we have 10, 15 minutes of time. If some of the members from the audience have some questions, maybe you can quickly write down and send them across with the organizers who are there. I request you to be direct and brief on the question so that he will be able to answer and then many more people would get the opportunity to clarify their doubts. Now this is not a seminar, nor this is a symposium. It is organized as a, a session wherein we would like to hear Dr. Fowley. Maybe there could be another fora, another symposium where you know, we could have that type of discussion, but the time is not structured for such a discussion. Therefore, I requested you if you have specific points on which a clarification could be given. Thank you.
Yes. Is dharma static or dynamic? Dharma is based on a universal principle, but there's always a local adaptation. Everything has to be adapted towards time, place, and person because there are also individual variations that are going on. But that adaptation is not a compromise. See? That is the point. Uh, for example, even relative to dietary factors, you have to make sure to have food that's appropriate to the place and the season and the, the time and place where you live. But that doesn't mean you're compromising the nutritional value of the food. And dharma is not just a fixed principle. It's not a belief. It's not an absolute you impose upon things. It's a way of understanding how things work. Dharma of fire is to burn. Dharma of water is to be wet. Uh, so in that regard, adaptation of dharma and non-compromise of dharma go together. Hinduism is related to previous birth. Do you believe in this? Well, all of our karmas are related to previous births because we're setting these motions in force in, in the movement of time. But as a soul, the soul exists beyond the movement of time. So karma is everything that we do. And so what happens is we forget in the present birth the karma is set in motion in the past birth and then we blame someone else or society for it. Okay, I don't think we can answer all these questions. <laughs> A few. Okay, what is your definition of the Sanatana Dharma? As he was saying, Swamiji earlier, Sanatana is eternal, but Sanatana also means perpetual. So it implies adaptation. It also implies universality. For example, and Sanatana Dharma is not based on, is inclusive of all dharmas. So it's not based upon uh, just one dharma alone. And dharma itself is the natural law or nature of things in the universe, uh, with his, which is both uh, practical and uh, ethical in nature. As Hinduism, I think we have enough questions to answer by him now. My request you to kindly refrain, because we don't have so much of time. We wish that each one of you are good enough to come and speak here, but the program is not structured for such an opportunity and we have to kindly put up with the small inconvenience and to the extent that we have received the questions, we request him to address them. If you want to speak with him personally, I think that could be arranged separately, but <laughs> see here, please, please, we'll try to answer as many as possible, kindly understand the difficulty of the organizers. I, I am not the organizer. I am like one of you here. I also have 100 questions to answer and get his answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, I agree. I agree, sir. I agree with you. I agree. I know, I know, I know. No, no, you see. No, see, I, I agree. No, no, see, no, please, please understand. <laughs> I, I think you have already made your point. Let us request the speaker to answer the questions. Okay. Yeah, what? Yes, I didn't understand this question, but uh, okay. Including through the voice of India, and a number of these books are available online at no charge. Uh, the more re we have a more recent one, which is uh, Universal Hinduism. Well, there's a whole set through the uh, Voice of India. And uh, even this uh, Arise Arjuna, 
has gone through nine printings in India already. And then in the Swami Narayan Akshar Dham in Delhi on ancient India, there's a whole book called Hidden Horizons that they give out. They give out to many people who have come. They've distributed more than 20,000 copies on India's cultural heritage. And we have others few other publishers. So we do have books and online articles. We've addressed a lot of these things uh, that way because I know I'm not going to be able to, to address all these particular questions today. And there are many other authors and uh, writers who have addressed a lot of these issues. Uh, Ram Swaroop and Sita Ram Gol and uh, many others that can also, you can also look for uh, their writings as well. Now to get back to few questions that we have here. Someone's asking about the Mayan calendar, which says the world would come to an end on December 31st, 2012. Uh, usually, if you're going to predict the end of the world, make sure to make it a few years down the road so that you can financially benefit from your prediction before it fails to occur, <laughs> because the world continues. But as I say, our view is that we're coming into a difficult transitional, we are in a difficult transitional era where we have developed a certain uh, technological and scientific knowledge, but not the spiritual wisdom to deal with it. And so what's happening is that uh, the destructive effects or the, or the debilitating effects of this technology are now starting to come into play. So that inner wisdom needs to be developed. Hinduism can be very helpful in doing that. Uh, will Hinduism survive against evangelism in the future? One of the interesting things about the evangelical movement in America is that often the children of the evangelicals revolt against them. So their ability to hold their own generation to go on for more than a generation or two is not very good. 